and welcome to Science on Trial and Error. My name is Kasia Kuzmich-Kowalska. I'm a PhD student in developmental biology at IST Austria, and I'm the host of this podcast. Today, we will go away from the usual format of the episodes and introduce a new special series called Case Study. Case studies will be recorded as discussions with several guests focusing on a specific topic to give you all different insights and different perspectives. We decided to start with a case study of beginning PhD studies at times of pandemic. As it is the first episode in this new format, I wanted to try with a bit more familiar setting. And that's why I ask PhD students from IST Austria to share their views with me. They all started their PhD last year. While I do know that some of their specific examples may not be easy to translate to programs at other institutes and universities, I believe that a lot of their experiences will resonate with other students out there, regardless where they are. I also think that the advice they give may help new students who will start their PhD adventure this year. Allow me to introduce my lovely guests. Kristin Fiedler comes from Barbados and she is a PhD student in chemistry. She is now affiliated with the group of Professor Maria Ibanez. Prior to her studies at IST, she got her master's degree in polymer chemistry at Johannes Kepler University in Linz, Austria. Ishita Gupta is originally from India and she is pursuing her PhD in neurodevelopment in the group of Professor Simon Hippenmeyer. Before she came to IST, she finished her master's studies in medical genetics at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Rebecca June Morse Mora comes from Spain and she is a neuroscience PhD student with the group of Professor Peter Jonas. She obtained her bachelor's degree in biotechnology from Imperial College London in the UK with a year of research done abroad at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. Last, we have Valentin Hübner. He is from Austria and he joined Professor Chatterjee Group to study game theory during his PhD. He got his integrated master's degree in mathematics from University of Cambridge in the UK. We tried to give you different perspectives, for example, on applying for a PhD and deciding where to go when you cannot visit the place, or on working during lockdowns as a theoretician versus wet lab student. We also discussed online courses, rotations, and many more. Last year was definitely challenging in many ways for all of us, and it's important to acknowledge the struggles and the successes. I find it inspiring how well we all did in spite of the situation. We are thinking of more episodes in this format, so please let me know if there's a topic that would be of special interest to you, you can reach me at scienceandtrialanderror at gmail.com or through our Instagram and Facebook accounts. I really love hearing from you. And now please enjoy case study beginning a PhD at times of pandemic with Christine, Ishita, Rebecca and Valentin. Hi everyone, thank you for joining me today in our first special episode, a discussion about beginning your PhD at the times of pandemics. With me today, there are four guest speakers. Uh, let's start with Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm originally from Spain and arrived at IC and Austria in 2020, uh, September 2020. And right now I'm starting my PhD in neuroscience. All right, and now we can go to Christine. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Christine. I arrived in Vienna in 2020, but I was in Linz, Austria, um, prior. Currently, I'm with the Ibanians group working in thermoelectrics. Great. Then we have Ishita. Hi, Ishita. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Ishita. I'm originally from India. And I was in um, Vancouver, Canada for my master's. Uh, that's where I got interested in uh, neurodevelopment. And I've always really liked genetics. So I really like the 
group here that I've joined, which is the Hippenmaya group. And yeah, I begin my neuroscience PhD here this year with everybody else. And like everyone else, I also came here in September 2020. <laughs> okay, and last but not least, we have Valentin. Hi. Hello. I am actually from Vienna, so for me, the transition was particularly easy. But I still lived on campus for this year with all the other students, which was a great decision. So I got to know everyone. And I, I studied mathematics in my bachelor's and master's. Now I'm doing game theory in the chat group. Okay, great. I'm very glad you guys joined me and your backgrounds are so different. So I hope we will get a lot of different insights and this hopefully will be helpful for our new students starting soon. We actually got a lot of questions from our listeners and from communities on Twitter and Instagram to ask you. So I'm going to start by one of them, which I think would be a good point to start our discussion. And the question is, how did pandemics affect your application process for the PhD and the final decision? I mean, we know that the applications are in winter, so it was right at the beginning of the COVID pandemics. And then, of course, because of all the lockdowns, I guess you guys couldn't come and see the Institute live. So how did it yeah. work for you? Uh, how about we start with, with Ishita? Like you said, it started, um, the application process starts around um, November, December. And at the time, it seemed like everything would be possible and you can visit campuses. And I was in the process of applying and had, in fact, even booked tickets to come to ISD Austria, for example. But by February, it was quite clear that that would not be possible. And um, everything happened in a matter of days, I think within a week things really changed. The schedule uh, travel was, I think, March for all of us for mm -hmm. visiting the campus. And within a week, it went from, yes, you can come to no, you cannot come. And we'll have to cancel everything. And in my experience, IST Austria was quite um, supportive in terms of uh, proactively telling us that, don't worry, we will reimburse everything. And they managed to take care of that side of the administrative process very well. I feel like there were some programs that I had applied to that really did not communicate very well. Yeah. I understand because nobody really knew what to do and everything was changing in a matter of days. The the a very prompt communication from IST was really nice, but I would say overall, most programs were sort of off the radar. I mean, there, there was zero communication and it was very hard to understand where you're going and what's what's happening. So it was a bit of a, it was, it was a stressful time. And you, Rebecca, you were moving from UK to come to yeah. IST. So did you have a chance to actually come and visit campus or was it also all happening online? Yeah, it was online, same as uh, Ishida mentioned. Yeah, once we got uh, shortlisted for interviews, that's when we started to plan arriving here. I even think I booked a hotel. I'm not even sure about that. But I remember interviews were going to be around the time I had to finish my final year thesis of like my bachelor mm -hmm. thesis. Actually, for me, it was quite convenient that it wasn't in person because um, I was able to schedule my interviews around my working hours. I do think that it would have been really nice to be able to, of course, be in person, see everything, see the campus, because yeah. you're kind of committing to a five-year, or well, five or however long it might be, a uh, PhD into somewhere that you've never seen. But back then, for me, the online application was done really easily by mm -hmm. ISC, and it was, for me, it was quite convenient, to be honest. So did you actually attempt to do any research into how it is at IST, like contact someone or, I don't Oof. know, have a look at, like, how did you actually look into the institutes? Because I'm sure you applied not only to IST. So yeah. how did you try to get a feeling about the places when you couldn't see the institute life? Mainly, I remember I used to read, there are some like student statements. I mean, of course, these are like portrayed by the Institute for the Institute, but at least it gives you the feeling that some real person has set that behind. Yeah. And then I also looked at some of the, I think it was some YouTube videos. There was this one YouTube video from someone that was doing an internship here like a long time mm -hmm. ago, I think. And they showed a video about the apartments and things like that. So 
that's kind of where I drew like the closer picture of the Institute. Apart from that, research wise, just seeing a bit who's working here, like what work they're doing. Now looking back, I wish I had been more proactive about reaching students and reaching people here at ISD, which I, as I said, I was quite busy back in London. So I kind of didn't do much of that. And now with incoming students, that's one of the first things I would tell them to do, just reach out to as many people as you can and get as many different statements and as many different points of view before you come here, if you want and you have the chance, because that's something I really didn't do. And now looking back, I would have done. Mm -hmm. What about you, Christine? You you said you were in Lens, right? So maybe yeah. you actually could come and see the Institute or were you also relying on the online interviews? Well, for me, I... I had a similar situation like Rebecca, even though I was here in Austria. Um, I had booked the hotel. I was ready to see the institute for what it was. But I also was writing my thesis around that time. So when they canceled, I wasn't actually heartbroken. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but for me, I had already gotten a feel about the institute. And actually, the group that I'm working with now is actually the main group I came to IST for because my master's supervisor, she knew a postdoc who was working in the lab here and it was about nanofunctional materials. He said that the PI is great. I hadn't met um, Maria in person, but it was a, a selling point for me. And I just did some research mm -hmm. and it also helped that my family in Linz really did not want me to leave Austria. I had applied to um, universities in America. I got accepted, but yeah. my family was a selling point for me to stay um, at ISD. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I can see why. And also in, in the times of pandemics, the, the US situation, I guess, was not very clear. Exactly, exactly. What about you, Valentin? You are in UK studying, right? That's true. Um, by the time of interviews, I think I was already here. I, I think when we arranged them, I was still in Cambridge. And then I, I came here and I took the interviews from home. And actually, that was quite convenient, I think. I would have been much more nervous if I had to face my interviews in person. So, you know, being in your own room, it's very relaxed. And I got the chance to have a look around campus because I just, I searched for a random talk online and I went to that in the main lecture theatre, got to know some people. I actually bumped into someone who is in the group that I was mainly interested in and that I'm now affiliated with. So I got the chance to ask some questions. Okay, so you guys said that Actually, the interviews at home were more comfortable. And I guess I can see why, because I went through the process of coming here. And even though you can see the campus, of course, and you can have a look around and maybe talk to some students, the atmosphere also gets much more stressful when you see all of your competition and you hear all of the stories and all of these testimonies and everybody's like so cool and imposter syndrome hitting hard. You know, you're like, what am I doing here? Someone will realize it's not the right place. So I guess maybe for your confidence, it could have been actually a good thing. So did you also have a chance to talk to some students when you were doing the interviews? Was it something that was useful for you? Christine? Yeah, I actually spoke to um, a couple students within the physics department because that's where we're based, even though we're going to transition into the chemistry building soon. I spoke to a couple students um, just to get a feel of the lab and the workings. But I mean, at the end of the day, actually being there and experiencing it for yourself is, a, is another story. But I think that the feedback from students really help. You just made a, a point about like the confidence and your confidence would be higher and so forth. Yes, it was. Um, <laughs> but we did we did form a um, a co well a pre cohort chat before because it really helped with um, <laughs> communication. Like based on our interpretation from the emails, or I said not everyone was clear, uh -huh. and some persons were really proactive in explaining. Yeah, so we have to apply to this. You have to contact your PIs, or your PIs will contact you, and so forth. So it really helped with your nerves and the um, maybe the panic inside because you're not here. Yeah. What about you, Shita? I think we were talking during our interviews. Exactly. I was in Canada and I was, I think, being so far away overseas um, has its own stress of what am I doing? Where am I going? I had zero idea. 
um, of the you know European network of <laughs> PhD programs or places. So I think I really needed to talk to people to get to know uh, that this whole big leap of going from one side of Atlantic to the other is worth it. Luckily, um, I think the PhD buddy system was really good and I had my PhD buddy and I could connect with you. And then through some contacts, I also managed to connect with a PhD student in the Hip and Maya group, which mm-hmm. was also a group I was interested in. Um, with, I think, these two uh, connections, it really helped me get the details of how to apply, what's required. For me, um, I think just understanding the visa process, being an Indian citizen, and also like how does it work in the pandemic and what are the groups, what are the details of the program. And I think talking to students really, really helped. So have you actually thought about seeing how the situation was developing to not go to Europe, to, to stay in America and to not move? Well, yes, I mean, I wanted to come, but I was not sure if the pandemic uh, would affect the ability to come um, based on my travel documents and visa because all embassies were closed. And I had no idea if I could apply for my visa because I have to get a visa to travel to anywhere, basically. So I had thought of a backup option, not a PhD, but if, if I hadn't been able to join or come here, I would have probably worked as a research assistant in a lab in Canada or USA. I was already talking to some labs and then applied next yeah. year again. Yeah. Something. Yeah. From the point of view with discussing things with Institute and getting this kind of information from the Institute, how much support did you receive with organizing all of the documents necessary to travel during the lockdowns and during the these difficult times? Was it actually that you had to do a lot by yourself? How would you say? I must say that we have Vlad, Vlad Kozak, who's in charge of, I mean, he's head of HR and also was in charge of international students like me. And I have to say he was so prompt and very, very helpful. He told me exactly what documents I needed and what I'm supposed to do. And he even gave me updates about what kind of pressure the institutes are putting on the country to sort of open the embassies uh, overseas and was constantly checking in as well about whether I managed to get a visa appointment or not. Uh, Really helped me with all the documents that was needed and gave me a lot of information in terms of prep of what Mm -hmm. I need to do. I must say that he was one of the most helpful. I mean, no other program that I applied to gave me the kind of help that Vlad gave me. That's nice. What about you, Rebecca? Did you need help with with moving and with organizing your travels? And was IST helpful with this as well? I didn't really need anything, actually, document-wise or or travel-wise. Like, I remember because we had, a, as uh, they mentioned before, we had a group chat where, where we spoke mm-hmm. about, as I said, like applications and everything since the very, very beginning. And at some point when time was coming near to arriving, a lot of the group chat which is completely normal, was taken over by visas and transport documents. And I remember very luckily I could skip all of those messages. I didn't really need anything, but anything that I asked or anything that was needed, they were very, very supportive. I mean, I think they were probably more stressed than we were uh, for our arrival. Like when we arrived, they were like, we're so surprised that all of you made it here because at some point they didn't even believe that we were going to be able to arrive here. There were people that arrived much later because of their visas or mm-hmm. transport documents, like as she to mention, like embassies being closed and things like that. But sooner or later, we all, we all made it in our time. So coming back to what Christine said about staying because of her family, was it also something important for you, Well, when you were choosing the PhD? Did you want to stay in Austria to be close to your family and because of the situation? Um, my family and my friends as well. I think actually when we started to apply to IST, that was before the whole pandemic started, right? Yeah. So I guess I already decided before the pandemic to come back to Austria. At first, I wanted to stay in in England, do something else, become a software engineer. And then I thought, it's kind of sad. I have friends in Cambridge, but I would now move to London. My friends from Cambridge would mostly spread across England, back to where they're from or somewhere else. And then I'm in a new city again and I know no one. I might as well actually go back home. 
that's when I decided, you know, look for something and I know I'm IST. But it had nothing to do with the pandemic. So how big was your cohort when you guys began last year? Do you know? 65 people. That's a lot of people. And mm. you, Rebecca, mentioned that not everyone arrived at the very beginning. So I guess this was uh, one of the things that got quite chaotic. So I was wondering, how did you actually stay in touch and how were you getting along and how were you meeting, except for the, of course, online group chats? I guess the apartments helped with that, but you had no courses in person. Was there anything actually happening to to facilitate your integration? As you said, for me, the, the group we had at the beginning was a great, great saver. And since we arrived in September, there were restrictions, but outside, if I remember correctly, the restrictions were not too harsh at that point. Mm -hmm. And there was still good weather. The first week, I believe, uh, before like all the courses started and everything, we were able to meet. We were already here, so we were able to go swimming, and we were able mm -hmm. to like uh, be by the pond for a couple of the evenings after our welcomings. I think one or two lectures at the beginning were in person. I remember that was quite exciting because we arrived, we're getting to go to classes and getting to go for lunch after with people. But then that was cut quite <laughs> shortly after. And I think we've spoken about this, all of us here a lot. Uh, at least for me, the apartments have been a great saver during mainly winter and with COVID. So that was the main social contact we had. And of course, for experimentalists, we could still see each other in the buildings or bump into each other whilst working. I do know that for theoreticians, it's been a bit harsher in general, not only for our year, but for experimentalists, I think living in the apartments and being able to bump into each other, given the situation, was not as bad. Yeah, so while well, you you are the theoretician in the in this group, yeah. <laughs> how was it for you? Were you actually working entirely remotely this whole time? Were you able to use the students' offices? How was it with with the yeah. rules? I used the student offices uh, almost every day, but the people who shared my office, many of them were experimentalists. Often I was alone. But I think most of the people I met, I met in the cafeteria because the cafeteria stayed open, as you know, um, throughout the entire um, year. It was kind of a central hub. It was, it was difficult that, you know, my, my professor who I eventually affiliated with, but also the um, other professors that I did rotations with and the other collaborators in the groups. I didn't meet any one of those people in person. I only saw them on the screen ever. That was quite difficult most of the time. Yeah, this is one of the things that a lot of people have been asking. How actually did you find it to get to know the group and the PIs mm -hmm. if you couldn't meet them in person? Because I know that also in some groups, even experimentalist groups, the PIs were not there all the time mm -hmm. and the lab members were not there. I guess in your case, Valentin, it was the harshest because you really didn't interact yeah, actually, it still hasn't changed. And I would say, personally, I don't know. We've only ever you know, met for very defined amounts of time um, to talk about you know, academic matters and then switched off the meeting. I think if you're in an office, you also have a chat about other things, personal things, you go for lunch. But even, even work-related, I think if you're just, you know, if you're working on something, thinking about something and you can just, you have an idea and you talk yeah. about it to someone else in the room. That's very valuable. And, or just looking at the same sheet of paper, pointing out something, using mm -hmm. your finger. It's easier. So, yeah, I, I was really missing that. How did you make your decision about the group? Did you have enough contact with the, with the supervisors to really discuss the project? Did you take a bit of a leap of faith? <laughs> How did it go for you? Personal relationship between me and the PI didn't wasn't part of my decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I think I think he seems like a very supportive person, so that's good. And also, well, I would say two of my rotations didn't go very well, and one went well. So it was an easy decision anyway. Yeah. I see. Uh, I see. And now, are you actually looking forward to, or are you a bit worried about working with much more people around? Do you think this will? affect your focus? 
Uh, no, I look forward to it. You look forward to it, okay. What about uh, you, Shita? How did it go with your rotations and with your interactions with with the groups and with the PIs? Did you find it more difficult than you would expect? I would say that compared to theoreticians, I think it was easier, like Rebecca said, because we were allowed to come to the lab and work, even as rotation students. You're right, there was a time when I think our first rotation started around October beginning, and November is when a hard lockdown happened, and a lot of people were working from home strictly, and the supervisors and the PIs were not around. So I do think that I did not get to interact with the PIs as much during my rotations as I would have liked. And I think one very peculiar thing that happened in ISD, I would say, uh, was that we have a lot of centralized facilities for which we need to get trained. Mm -hmm. And in my case, let me just give my example. We had to get trained in a special type of microscopy called confocal microscopy. And I had never done this before. And it was quite crucial to my very first rotation. And this is when I had just arrived here, did not know what's happening. November was a hard lockdown. There were not a lot of people around. And it is something where I feel like every experimentalist would relate where I would say that you always work with the more senior members of the group during your experiments, especially when you're doing a new technique or a new protocol or something new. It's just how it goes, right? The older students always teach or train the younger ones and uh, we can shadow them. And it's always something that you do together. And because of the COVID rules, uh, we were not allowed to do that. So for a lot of these um, complicated <laughs> um, instruments where we really needed the support and the guidance of senior students, we were not allowed to work together because of the COVID rules. And I think that personally to me really <laughs> affected my rotations and the, the time it took me to learn certain things. Something, something very specific like that happened, which usually would doesn't really apply to everybody and everyone but I do think that just the fact that there were not enough people in the lab probably to shadow you or to help you that probably affects experimentalists in that regard but I definitely think that it, it was better because I could definitely meet mm -hmm. um, all of my supervisors in person at least uh, a couple of times during my rotations I met all the members of the lab eventually and I, I got to know them we could talk about science and non-science topics and I think that was very good in that regard I think just uh, being able to go to the lab and meet people was very helpful actually touching up upon what Ishita said about learning from other students I would be interested in hearing about your experience Christine seeing as the chemistry department at IST is still very Let's call it tiny. How did it go for you? Like, I guess you, of course, rotated with Maria Ibanez, but where did you do your other rotations? And did you have enough of uh, groups to actually learn what you wanted to learn here at IST or was it, was it problematic? I think coming from a chemistry background, I knew I wanted to work with the Ibanez group, but finding other groups that I could rotate with, especially in the initial application, was a bit challenging. Mm -hmm. But I came in from a very diverse background, more so. Um, I did technical chemistry with biochemistry. And then in my master's, I did polymer chemistry, but my thesis was focused on nanomaterials. And during my bachelor thesis, I was doing computational chemistry. Mm -hmm. So I was not a stranger to working with code. So I decided to, first of all, apply to the y 2 Kytis, um group. They deal with soft matter. And I applied to the Goodrich group. Mm -hmm. They also deal with soft matter, but on a theoretical computational base. However, during my interview process, I got an email from Stefan Freundberger. He told me he heard about me during my interviews. He's an electrochemist. He's joined, he has joined the group at IST. And for me, I think that I wasn't aware of him because I don't think that IST publicized that mm -hmm. oh, we have yeah. a new chemistry professor here. I think that happened after I arrived. But I interviewed with him. Then I said, yeah, this would be a better fit. 
Um, however, I think ISC fosters this interdisciplinary um, aspect of, of learning. So I really wanted to challenge myself. And I mean, it's a rotation, so I stuck with um, Carl Goodridge. Mm -hmm. um, my first rotation was in electrochemistry with Stefan Freinberger. Um, he had just one postdoc there, so I worked with the postdoc. Uh, fortunately, it went really well because... I, I think even in the absence of Corona, my experience would have been the same. Okay. It was very hands-on. I was learning on the go. But the Ibanez group, her group is a bit bigger. But I think in the absence of Corona, I don't think anything else would have gone differently because the postdoc is very hands-on with me. I learned as much as I could. And with courses as well, they were still in person with her. So, and then with the Goodrich group, even though it was theoretical and our meetings were done on Zoom, he was very supportive. He had no postdocs, but he he made me feel seen. Mm -hmm. I, I I have to give him his credit. He would ask me, aside from my project, is ISD doing enough for you? And that made me feel like, you know, the PI really cares for my well-being. He was really amazing. I always say, like, if I was a theoretician, I probably would have. <laughs> it would have been a signed deal right there and then. I think my experience overall was very fortunate and everything went really well in my case. Yeah, that's quite striking. You know, I feel that especially with people who are working remotely or in theory, to have this contact with the PI would require much more effort from both sides. And I guess not everyone's experience has been so so good when it comes to that. But this is nice that you had this experience. So Rebecca, I think we didn't mention it, but you are in the Peter Jonas group, right? Yep. Uh, yep. So how did it go for you? I think your PI was not so much on campus during the pandemics. No, my rotation with the Jonas group was the last rotation. My first two rotations were in the Shigemoto and the Chigsvari group. I, I mean, to be honest, my, my experience has been quite similar to Christine's. I mean, although they, both Chigsvari and Jonas, they weren't present uh, on campus, but they were reachable by Zoom or Skype. With my first rotation in the Shigemoto group, Shigemoto was always there, was always available. People in the labs, I, I wasn't able to meet all of the members, but there were always enough people that I could go ask for help or that could help me. All my supervisors have been extremely, extremely helpful in all the three rotations I've had. I think with or without Corona, apart from, of course, meeting everyone and being able to be a bit more social and meet maybe more on a personal level, everyone. But rotation-wise, I think with or without Corona, they would have been quite the same. Uh, as you said, Casa Jonas hasn't been on campus until quite recently because of COVID. But being able to reach him or speak with him or meet with him at any point has been very, very accessible. He has always been available. So that also made my decision quite easy. And knowing a bit more how the group is and what the dynamic is and meeting the people uh, in my last rotation was very easy. It made it much easier to make the decision and to gauge a bit more how the group is. Because I think, at least for me, one of the main things I was looking for when rotating was the group dynamic mm -hmm. and the relationship with the PI or with the group. But I think once you speak with a couple of people and you can actually go for lunch or see a bit more how people interact, you can get I mean, of not the full picture, but you can get an idea of what dynamic is within the group and different people can give you different perspectives. Although you might not get, get the full experience, at least for me in the three rotations, I think I got enough information and I was able to see enough from them to, to make my decision. Basically, for some of you, it was much more clear who you want to join already early on. And for some of you, the rotations really helped a lot. What about the support that you were getting in general in the situation, not only with respect to your learning process and to your work in the lab or work on your research during the rotation, do you think that the support that you were receiving from grad school during these times was, was enough? And what did they do to actually support you during this pandemic situation to make it easier for you to, to meet, to not be uh, super left out and... Was there something that you actually feel that could have been done more to feel fully supported? 
maybe well maybe i can i can jump in i'm maybe also a bit biased in this because from january onwards like david and i have been the gsa rep so we've had a lot of contact with the graduate school and one of the major topics that was talked about was how can we mainly as we spoke about before right making field theoreticians they're not just left out and completely alone in all of this and isolated but social wise what i was missing and i think what we all miss was a bit more of casual social contact and casual bumping into people and just making it feel like place is alive and that you can just chill a bit and, and we did try to brainstorm and think about things but we always go back to the same thing right socializing if it's going to be online it's it's just going to end up feeling the same and there's always going to be a lack of personal touch even if you do have talks and you have interactive things it's very easy for people to turn off their cameras and i mean not that i not that i don't do it i mean it's just very easy because at some point you're in your house and you're like do i want to keep just sitting down and just listening to people on zoom and that cut out a lot of that social aspect ideally for me what i missed was being able to have a more interactive way of meeting people or being with people but how could this have been done i'm i'm not quite sure as i said for the rest of the aspect since i didn't run into any in like any big or individual problems i don't have any things that i say oh maybe this should have been changed or this could have been done this other way but i'm sure that there could have been ways to support more or maybe receive support in other realms what about you guys ishita val anything that could have helped you or like make you feel more supported i think i definitely agree with rebecca that just casual social interactions were missing rotation periods are i think everybody would agree the more stressful part of the first year i feel once now that we have all affiliated i can see the difference that rotation periods are definitely more stressful i was going to say that maybe i was just thinking that if there was a bit more outreach in terms of if you want to talk to a counselor or a therapist i think that could have been nice because i think a lot of people were under added pressure because of covid and rotations and i think maybe i mean if there was something that was very well advertised that you know we have this um extra sessions or extra visits from a counselor on campus counselor or on campus therapist i think i would have just gone for sure just to get a talk out of it but i must also actually acknowledge the faculty mentors that we all had and that is i think something that the grad school does right and i think that uh, really helped because they were supposed to check in after every rotation with you and see how your rotation mm-hmm. went and what you look forward to i mean they're not professional <laughs> counselors or therapists but i think in my case at least my faculty mentor was really supportive and very nice and It sort of felt like a therapy session to me really and they always try to align you with a faculty mentor whose subject is really far removed from yours so there is no yeah. conflict you feel very comfortable talking to them about your uh, rotation experiences and if you are struggling with your supervisor or your pi or your experience in any way so i think that i must admit was very nice but i think also having an actual counselor and therapist uh, it's a potential idea for the future yeah i guess also with the mentors The good thing is that it's more proactive in a way that there's some sort of psychologist at IST in some you know vague way we know about but even to receive email kind of checking up on you maybe it would have been better because then you feel a bit more seen and you feel a bit okay someone cares actually if I'm doing fine or not to have this a bit of a reach out to you to check are you okay or is everything fine because i guess for all of you guys this whole transition you move to the apartments and of course you have fortunately each other's company which is great but on the other hand the campus is still super super remote and it's a bit of a bubble in a sense that you can hang out together but on the other hand it's very easy to to get very lonely there especially in the winter times i lived there as well you know like and it wasn't even pandemics and you kind of can get into this situation where you just go to work and then you come back to the apartment just five minutes from work and 
this becomes a bit of a loop. Yeah, maybe this is something that could be supported better to kind of check with people if they have enough contact with someone outside of their their bubble. Uh, what about you, Christine? Anything else comes to mind? I think, too, sometimes it, it's hard to say, like, what they could have done better, given that we don't know what it was before Corona. Mm -hmm. So I think that ISC really did the best that they could, given the situation. You understand? Like, the pandemic was a, a, a new sure. thing worldwide granted before we actually got to campus it stopped for a bit and yeah. they didn't want the science to stop i think that isd did really the best that they could and i agree with this sheet maybe you know just a heads up guys you know we have a psychologist if you guys want to talk you know a little more frequent mm -hmm. just so that everyone knows like especially for those who came here by themselves who were also scared because we also have to check ourselves there are those who were not afraid of corona, you know, and were not afraid to say, hey, and me, well, meet with the social restrictions. Yeah. But then there were those who were really scared of the actual um, situation, the, the entire pandemic. I think actually, you know, checking in with those would have helped and, and so forth. But the mentors really did help. Like mine is super supportive. And even given that they are PIs, yeah, it's a very casual conversation and you feel like you know them, you've been talking to them for, for years and it's very, just very fluid. So I think that really helps. I think on from ISD side, they really did manage it quite well. Yeah, it was a learning curve for them as much as it was for us. I mean, we're still in a pandemic. So I think for the 2021 cohort, they're going to benefit from the mistakes I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why I'm asking, because, of course, they dealt with it the best to their abilities. And unfortunately, the situation is persisting. We might face another lockdown. The new students are coming. They are also going to end up in this crazy world of, of the COVID pandemics. And perhaps there's something that could help to support them better and, you know, to kind of make the learning curve even quicker to to achieve a, an even better situation for them. But I think individually, I would just say like, so the cohort coming in, be active within yourself as well. Like reach out, you know, like if you're going through something, say be vocal because not everyone will know your problem or, or be active within yourself as well. Like don't lose yourself within the pandemic. And I think that would help ISC also to cater to your needs. Sometimes they don't know. You have to say, like, send an email, be mm -hmm. active. Just be active. So I, I think that would be my advice to the, the court coming in. Agreed. I mean, it's not only that IST is the, the big institution, but it's also the community of people. Exactly. And I think it's important for all of us, not only the PIs and not only the grad school, but also just yeah, people in the group and uh, in general students towards students, it's important to have a look at other people if they are doing fine. You know, it could be someone who has been already here for quite some time, but we all had problems with dealing with the situation, whether you, we were afraid for ourselves or we were afraid for our families. We couldn't really go see them or even if we could see them, we were afraid that, you know, we would bring something home and then they will get sick. This whole situation is still very highly sensitive and it's important to have a look out and and like check in with people and check in with people who work more from home, check in with people who actually work super a lot. And it seems like they are overworking themselves. It's just important to, to keep that in mind. All right. So let's move to another question from our listeners. Do you think that starting the PhD during pandemics had actually some unexpected positives? Ishita, you're nodding. I think this also touches upon what Rebecca and Christine had mentioned about thesis writing, but I must say that I was writing my master's thesis and the pandemic stops all lab work, right? And it gave, a, like, my PI could not push me to do more experiments. And also... <laughs> Everything was logged and um, there was a very strict uh, rule about how, where you can go, where you cannot. And I managed to finish writing my thesis in a lesser time than what it would have taken me otherwise. 
given you know your pmi pressure you to produce more data in this case i couldn't so the, it was very clear that whatever data i have and whatever i have done so far i just continue with it so i think that for sure i think a lot of us who wrote our thesis would agree with what about classes did you like that they were online or would you prefer to have the courses in person and i would have preferred to have them in person but of course for your early mornings there are perks to being in your house and not having to rush i mean although it's only down the hill right like it isn't even that far away it, it wouldn't have taken that much effort to get to class on oh, time oh believe me sometimes in winter <laughs> it's hard I mean, it, it did it did feel like this happened to me like i would wake up for class and even though i was in my house i was like am i going to be late to this class even though i just have to open my laptop and turn on my camera I mean ideally I I I would have preferred them in person but yeah I mean I would say one of the perks of taking them online is not having to wake up earlier. I think I can add to this because yeah. coming from like the chemistry background I had to do external courses at the University of Vienna before covid I probably would have had to during my work day and I'm an experimentalist so then tailor my experiments around leaving ISD to go to Vienna to sit down in a class yeah. for an hour then to leave Vienna to come back to Kloster Neuburg so I think what would have taken me like maybe three hours out of my working day took me just the hour for the class a simple opening of my laptop maybe i could have been in the lab the same time while yeah. the lecture was taking place i think that classes being online for that aspect was a positive <laughs> for me for sure yeah. for sure and i had um professors who were teaching at the university of vienna but they were in the uk i think that also helped for them as well they didn't have to be actually in Austria teaching the course as well so i think that was the positive that came out of it did you guys had a chance to take part in any of the conferences online and did you like this experience well from my end i attended two conferences so far um one was actually coordinated by my pi i'm not sure for uh, the others here but the nano g conference yeah it was online but I, there was a platform where you had to create an avatar that probably looked like you but then you can walk around i don't know if you know the old pokemon mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um pixelated type thing but yeah that's how the forum was and you can walk around and then when you got near to another avatar their camera would open so you can speak to them Okay. So that's how the platform was to create Quite that. Quite fancy. That, yeah, to create that that interface where, you know, you're not missing out on actually connecting with persons and so forth. So, I mean, in that aspect, it was really good from their part. I'm not sure about other conferences, to be quite honest, but that was really good. For me, I, I personally don't like much poster sessions online. I find them very, very weird. I mean, maybe in some conferences... They really try to make it much more interactive, but in general, I really find it quite, quite weird. And this is something that I'm missing from the conferences. Another thing that people are curious, and I think we partially covered it, because you guys already mentioned some of the advice that you would give to students that will start now. Is there anything else that comes to mind that you think is an important piece of advice. So you mentioned speaking up and talking about how how you are. Is there anything else that you would like to convey? Uh, I mean, I've already said this before, but reaching out to as many people as you can that you might you think is useful, and well, mainly for rotations and things like that, being very open with your PI and supervisor. And just ask a lot and, and make sure that you have clear what you're doing or what you're going to do for the time being, what your objective is and that final decision and that like final box that you have to like mark in the rotation form. Just to be very clear about your intentions and their intentions just to make the whole process much more smooth between everyone and just to avoid the stress that you might have because you don't know what's actually yeah. going to happen or going on. In general, 
uh, with whatever realms, might it be mental health or might it be like professional decisions or whatever, just be open and reach out and be communicative. Just don't be scared to send emails or, I mean, I think most people are quite open to speak about their experience or if they're able to help you in any way. So yeah, don't be scared. Like just send an email. The worst thing that can happen is that you won't get a response <laughs> and then you can reach out to someone else. Do you guys felt when you arrived to do your rotations that it was very clear what is expected from you? And did you have a feeling that it's it's very easily laid out so that you can jump in? Because the rotations are short. They're just two months. As Ishita mentioned, a lot of things um, were stressful because maybe you were not going in a way that you would usually go for many different reasons. Also... As Val mentioned, you don't have so many interactions with your peers. So, yeah, was it clear from the beginning how individual your work will be? And did you feel like it's very clear for you what you have to do for this time period? What What do you think about that? Was it easy to communicate? Was it easy to change the project during the rotation? Was it easy to get feedback when things were not going so well if there was not so many people around? Let me start. I would say, um, of course, it's hard to compare because I've not done the PhD rotations during a time when there was no pandemic. But I must say, it's hard to expect or to have an idea of what exactly is it's going to be. So no, I don't think it was absolutely crystal clear to me what's going to happen. I also think every rotation, your dynamic with the PI, with the senior member who you're being uh, supervised by, and the project itself really can change. In some cases, for example, I hoped to be more independent and I couldn't. In some cases, I was told that, oh, we wish you were more independent. In some cases, I got the feedback that you were too independent, you should have taken more uh, input from others and sort of like worked more with other people and things like that. So I feel like that happens. And I also feel that lack of communication was happening because of the pandemic, because the default work mode at ISD yeah. was working from home. And so the PI or the supervisor or the senior postdoc or whoever you were working with, they were not on campus every day. So they were probably just coming in on the days they were supposed to come in. And maybe you were not working with them every day. So I feel like in my experience for my rotations, I think there were some cases where the project was very clear and I knew exactly what I'm supposed to achieve science-wise and data-wise. But what do I expect from, like, what kind of supervision I need? It was hard for me to gauge that initially. And what does the PI expect from me? Mm -hmm. Do they want me to work very independently? Are they judging my ability to independently lead the project or not? Or at this point, they're just seeing if I'm comfortable or not. I think that, I think, was uh, difficult. But that might also be independent of the pandemic. I think that's just what rotations in general uh, come with. The short answer is, I don't think it was super clear to me what was expected of me. Christine, what about you? For me, I think there's the initial form in IQ where we the PI has to fill out the form. I think that is one of the questions on there. Well, I was filling out the form with the PI. That was communicated very well. And that did not deviate throughout the rotation, whether even though I was working with postdocs, for instance, that did not deviate because at the end, you have to fill out the, the same IQ form again and where the PI goes through your strengths or weaknesses or what you have to work on. So I knew going in um, when I started the rotation, what was expected of me? Let's say, for instance, the PI wants a report at the end of the eight weeks, and I knew that going in. So when the PI says, oh, I, I want a, a summary of your entire experiments for the last eight weeks, it's not a shocker to me. I think throughout my rotations, both one, two, and three, um, that was communicated very well. Rebecca, I wanted to ask also from, from your perspective as a GSA rep, you kind of jump into the deep water, I must say... We didn't have the first year student as a rep, at least while I was here. It was kind of an unspoken rule that first years have already enough of the on their plates with rotations and the courses that maybe they should just focus on that and, and not take such a big thing on to themselves. And now you and David actually decided to do it. I mean, how do you feel 
about it right now after well it's it's a half a year or so right since you or even a bit more yeah I, I to be honest I can't recall specifically I know it was sometime at the beginning of the year I don't know if hmm? it was I think it's January but I might be Perhaps, might be wrong yeah. To be honest, I've been thinking about this more recently now because with the pandemic, apart from like administrative stuff and like organizing things and sending emails, there hasn't been much per se, that bulk of stuff that we had to do. So although it, it's something that you have to think about every week because there's something always yeah. every week coming up, there hasn't been much like a big workload until quite recently with the incoming students and interviews and all of that. And it is now that I'm thinking that taking this as a first year student might not be <laughs> the best of class. Did no one tell you? That's my question. Um, I don't. I don't think so per se. I mean, we we were told like there will be waves of of workload. Like there will be months where you have not much to do, and when incoming students and retreat and all of these things are happening, you will have a bigger workload to do. But maybe, I don't know, maybe I was hoping, not hoping, of course, but maybe I was thinking, you know, with pandemic, like mm -hmm. there won't be much to do, like online events, emailing people, like organizing things, but nothing too big. I think both David and I have realized that, yeah, it takes, it takes a bit more work than just that. I think now that we have affiliated, I would even say like more than being an obstacle with rotations and the courses and all of this. It is now that I'm affiliated and I want to start with this and focus on the project and like invest most of my time in this. Sure. It is now that I'm like, hmm, maybe doing it during your first year is not, not the best time-wise. And the other side of this is in terms of organizing things and knowing how things work, first years are the ones that know the least about how ISD runs by all means. I've never been an ISD, well, for a couple months, right? But I haven't been at ISC with events and another GSA rep that's not me or David. So I don't know what ISC looks like or I don't know how mm -hmm. ISC works like and things like that. So I think the inconvenience of David and I jumping into this, both, yeah. let's think about this, both being experimentalists, both being personers, which now looking back, that was kind of the decision we made. So there have been a lot of unknowns for us. I mean, we've received tons of help from tons of people, like previous representatives, super helpful, graduate school, very helpful, very fast and smooth with um, answers. Looking back, um, I think this is a job better fitted for people that know ISD yeah. um, and have been in ISD. It depends what it comes down to, I guess. You guys are the best feedback about, you know, courses and uh, all the first year experiences. But of course, when it comes to being GSA rep, you have to do a lot of things that that require, I guess, knowing the institute a bit better. And and even though you are here almost a year now, your experience of IST is very distorted by the pandemics. You didn't exactly. have a chance to take part in all of the things that were normally kind of a part of the calendar year or like all of these things that were usually happening. I think you guys are doing a very good job, but I was quite impressed that you decided to, to do this and I'm still continuing to be impressed. It's another thing I wanted to ask, do you feel like, of course you don't know how it was before, but in your opinion, did, were you receiving a lot of feedback from students about things that are necessary to, to convey further, to, to be advocate for them in something? Since we started, we received a couple like individual uh, concerns, suggestions, or requests, I would say. I think the feedback mainly came when questionnaires were sent out or mm -hmm. when uh, forms were sent out. People are quite willing to help and give feedback. And some of the feedback has actually been quite useful. Like another thing that, which might seem very obvious, but surprises me is that something that is very obvious to students and maybe might be very spoken and mm -hmm. we all agree that something should change and why is this like this things that might be very obvious for us as students once you take up to administration oh wow like thank you you know like we had no idea this is actually going on yeah in that sense like the feedback that we've gotten is always super useful and for most things that we put out people are very willing to to volunteer and to help as I said, like the major workload we're having is now with incoming mm -hmm. students and GSO uh, supports quite a lot. We have to work with them and 
with committees for the PhD retreat, for example, we're also receiving major, major help. I think like more of the actual workload is, yeah, once you have all of these different things to more than actually do them yourself to make sure that they're being done and that all of the different jobs are being delegated. So you guys are now moving out of the student offices and moving into your labs and also moving out of the apartments. I guess most of you moved to Vienna. So you're going to suddenly get more distance between you guys. And your batch is quite big. It's like 60 people. My batch was maybe 30. How do you guys feel? think you will stay in touch are you planning like group lunches or are you meeting and hanging out in vienna christine has decided for all of us we're we're not going to see each other anymore like we're our friendship ended in the apartment (laughs) done (laughs) that that is it for all of us we're a big cohort but i i feel like i thought the change was going to be much more noticeable but i haven't i don't know i still keep seeing everyone i still we still hang out i would say quite regularly like I haven't felt much of a difference for now of course like during the week it might not be you won't just like walk down the hill and and have dinner with someone but apart from that people I used to see I still see now we can actually get to do stuff in the city you know like we don't have to go for hikes all the time we're sitting in the grass (laughs) which is very nice which we I think we all enjoyed yeah Uh, but you reach a point share exactly we have our fair share of hill yeah now you have to discover vienna but i think also the fact that you were stuck let's call it stuck because of the pandemic stuck in the apartment even more than we were because you know you couldn't really travel so much and all these things you are even closer together because you probably have spent like you know christmas or other stuff together and then it it really becomes a bit more like a family than than just you know like colleagues from work i think now that uh, restrictions are going to be lifted um even though we don't live on campus together yeah. anymore, i think we will still have many opportunities to meet each other yeah it seems like you guys had not such an awful experience which is a good thing i guess yeah i think i think you you chose you chose a batch that yeah we were able to to see we were able to see each other during during lockdown. So, I mean, at least for me, but overall, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> the end. <laughs> the end. <laughs> Thank you guys for doing it. I think it will be helpful for people to, to get this overview and also for people who will consider applying. You know, it's it's been quite chaotic and I feel like when I was participating in the interviews and talking to people last year and this year, my experience is so much different than than yours. Of course, I can talk about the work and the research during the pandemics, but I have no idea how, what were your experiences on a bit more, I mean, it's a big change. It's a move either to another country or even a move to another place. And suddenly you are like completely alone for a lot of time. We were in such a lockdown that you couldn't really go anywhere else. So it's good to know that you guys survived. I'm glad you all found your spots and you're happy with your choices. And now you can, yeah, work on the fun stuff, which is your project. I wish you all the best. And I hope we can at some point catch up to, um, yeah, I would be very happy to hear how you guys are doing. And thank you for doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. It was my pleasure.